Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Gil. Welcome. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Ian Williams, trained as a biochemist uh, at the Universities of Bristol and Oxford and headed molecular sciences at Pfizer for 20 years. Later, he took an MFA from uh, Bennington College in Vermont He and his wife, Nancy Hudson, have a farm in Connecticut containing over 50 large-scale sculptures that Ian has made over the last decade. Together with Nancy, he has ridden in horseback safaris in many parts of the world. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Gil. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So, uh, as I mentioned, we don't really have a set agenda uh, for this conversation, so so we can take it wherever you would like to take it. But I would like to start, uh, you recently published a book um, and it's entitled A Bridge Bestiary. Um, I wondered if we can start there and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the motivation behind the book and, um, and perhaps some of the contents. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as you mentioned, um, about uh, 10 years ago, um, I took an MFA in writing from Bennington College of Vermont, and that was a culmination of an interest I've had for a long time in writing, which I find um, a very good way to organize one's thoughts and indeed even to find out what you're actually thinking by putting it down on paper. Um, I almost invariably write nonfiction, and um, I did publish a book um, probably 15 years ago about... um, my horseback riding experiences in Africa. Um, In any event, I've written uh, a number of articles for various magazines and I've always enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I had this idea um, probably in November of last year um, of writing this book, which is, uh, as you mentioned, its title is a bestiary. And a bestiary is um, a medieval concept when... um, people would write books about animals that they had heard of from travelers going mm. to various parts of the world. Yeah. And they would come up with these um, uh, descriptions of rhinos or something like that, which were often bore little resemblance to what we think of as a rhino. <laughs> but they, uh, they sold uh, lots of copies. People were always very interested to find out w- what strange animals were in other lands. And so the whole idea appealed to me. And as I looked into that um, idea, a number of people have written bestiaries and some quite recently. And I thought, well, that would be a fun thing to do because I've been around the world on on horseback and seen lots of different uh, animals. And so I thought, yeah, I'll give that a shot. Yeah, and it's organized um, uh, with, with, you know, kind of descriptions of uh, your experiences or your interactions with different, different animals. Yes. Um, in uh, in alphabets, uh, A for alligator is sort of the first chapter there, right? Um, right. And so I remember um, your previous book um, when you were in Africa, 
there was a um there was sort of a difficult situation right you um yeah uh, i don't know so almost like a life threatening situation in africa i don't know if yeah. i remember that correctly yeah yeah in fact that's really what put me on um the road to getting my mfa um this happened in 2004 when i was uh, 50 and um we were out riding in africa in kenya as it happened and i contracted very severe pneumonia um mm. and that's not something you want to do when you're out in the bush anyway i went to a, <laughs> a, a, a local hospital and they uh, called the flying doctor yeah. um and so i was flown to nairobi and i spent a couple of weeks in hospital half the time in intensive care there so it was a very touch and go thing and um that kind of experience is uh, really quite uh uh salutary and um i think having recovered from it very fortunate because it causes you to focus where you know what's important in your life what are you doing what are you really enjoying right so when i came back to the states um that was when i decided you know i've had a good run um in pharmaceuticals working with pfizer which is a great company and i learned a great deal and had a fine time but i thought well i'm still relatively young i um stop that and fortunately i had enough money to be able to do that and um then i really be- started my life as an artist um doing sculptures painting large and small uh, sculptures and um that's what really set me on that trail yeah did you did you have any training in that or you just no, picked it up yeah not at all and i think you know i i and i don't know if this was true with your experience growing up in india but growing up in england when i did in the 60s if you if you were if you could you know had a couple of marbles to rub together they immediately pushed you into sciences because i thought this was <laughs> the way of the future this was the 60s right you know the future is in plastics right yeah. so um so i took science from a very early age and i probably had i been a little more self aware or self confident when i was 14 or so i i may have gone more to the arts because i i enjoyed them i had a pretty good proclivity to languages um i always enjoyed english english literature but it, that just didn't work out and so i think there has been fomenting there for many years this unrealized ambition yeah. and uh, oddly enough my my close call as it were in africa freed me up if you like to be able to pursue that right um, right yeah i can i can definitely relate to that um and so i i sometimes you know describe to people you know if you if you didn't have a constraint uh in terms of education when i was growing up in india uh it's a bit like you know behind door number 1 is medicine behind door number 2 is engineering and you never want to open door number 3 <laughs> <laughs> exactly right <laughs> exactly right and uh, i had a sort of a similar uh journey like you i you know my dad uh, is a professor of engineering I went into engineering uh in that binary choice uh, that was presented to me uh but realized that I never really liked engineering that much um and so yeah it's 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 kind of interesting uh, I think in the US the the flexibility in that dimension uh, appears to be lot lot higher right compared to yeah. England or India yeah yes I I totally agree and as we both uh, know um the undergraduate um uh, opportunities here or or what people typically do for an undergraduate degree is often much much broader than the specialization that we both went through and i think that then gives you time to mature so that when you're in your early 20s right. and you if you want to stay in, in an academic career you then can choose your discipline uh puts you in a much better state than doing it at 14 which is essentially what happened to us. Yeah. Um, although I think it's important to say and I um I certainly I speak for myself um that it was a very good uh, I mean I enjoyed science I, and I it has stood me in very good stead and I think in the current world where science is being pushed to the side and emotions are playing a ever bigger part in making really quite important decisions mm-hmm. it's good to have that scientific background because it grounds you 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 have a rational thought process even though that may not manifest itself very often in economics at least it 
you know, there is an opportunity. You can really um, try to be objective about uh, situations which you face or that you see in the outside world. And then finally, um, it had afforded me a very good income. <laughs> yeah. allowed me to do lots of things that I had ever become an artist. We probably wouldn't be having this conversation now. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You know, so the, the breadth of experiences that you have uh, is good in, in, in one dimension, but uh, as areas get more and more specialized, uh, to actually make a contribution, you really have to dive deeper and deeper, right? Because there is there is only so much you can actually, um, you know, actually learn in a in a broad uh, broad perspective because you just don't have the time if you want to go deeper. So yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did. No, no, um, no, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, y- yes, you're right. I mean, it's um, it's back to um. The, um, the 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 metaphor of the fox and the hedgehog is, uh, uh, you know, you either um, are more of a dilettante, dabbling in lots of many different fields, or you just focus on one thing, like the hedgehog can roll up into a ball and protect itself. Um, I, I think there are clear benefits in both, and I don't, I'm not sure that um, you you need people who are able to work if indeed this is the case on uh, both ends of that spectrum yeah. so for example as we well know if somebody becomes highly specialized in order to be competitive in um, a scientific field let us say yeah uh, that is essential to make uh, progress because a lot of things are so complex now you have no time to look at other things on the other hand if you have a reasonable understanding across a broad area then it's like uh, you can recognize emergent phenomena. Um, you can recognize where to apply pressure, resources, investment that somebody who is much more specialized cannot see. Right. And the re- one of the great examples which impacted on my life fairly early on is that when I started my career in biochemistry, I became very interested in what's called intermediary metabolism. How does the body um, select, metabolize, use, and store all the different fuels, you know, protein, fat, um, carbohydrate. Yeah. And as you get more and more specialized in understanding the molecular biology of different cell types in fuel selection, you lose the bigger picture mm. of what the animal is trying to do to survive starvation or a hormonal change or stress. So you need to be, oper- to be able to operate at both um, uh, uh, ends, if you like, if indeed it is an end of this spectrum. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't cause it, a, uh, not that you're necessarily suggesting that, but I wouldn't say that it's a loss or a detriment. I think that you need both. Um, yeah. yeah. No, so, so, you know, that, so from a Western medicine perspective, um, I think, you know, we seem to be more mechanistic. We seem to be more you know, component by component, um, you know, analytics. Uh, Whereas the concept of Eastern medicine, for example, is more holistic. And and that's a term that, you know, most scientists don't like because it doesn't really mean anything. Um, But but it's a a different perspective. So, you know, I want to get your your thoughts on this. Um, Pharmaceuticals and medicine in general, you know, we seem to have hit a plateau. We're not seeing a lot of uh, extension in life. Um, and and more importantly, we are not seeing, uh, you know, utility enhancing you know, happiness, happy life extension, right? Um, we have a lot of medications. Much of them uh, are, you know, delivering very, very incremental benefits uh, to humans. And so... You know, I, I wonder, are we reaching a point where this mechanistic view of the body, you know, keeping it alive, keeping it alive a little bit longer, uh, is really a, a good way to think about it? Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, and I, I, I think of myself as adopting a middle way here. Um, I have read and thought a fair bit about what let's call for a shorthand more Eastern traditions of medicine, as you put it, holistic, considering the whole person, the energy of that person, whether 
one believes in chakras and things like that, or whether it's more of treating the overall psychology of the person that walks in the door. Um, and I feel that that is exceptionally important. Equally well, if somebody walks in with um, a mutation in some gene leading to a cancer, you better have the molecular uh, knowledge and therapeutics to be able to target that as precisely as possible uh, right. to save them. And those are sort of obvious points. But it's that middle ground of knowing when to go and which way to go. I have a good friend who is a GP, and he's, um, he's you know, he's in his early 70s, but he is without mm -hmm. doubt one of the best GPs I know because he has so much experience and he can almost read somebody when they walk through the door and can assess uh, with a few questions a lot of the things that are troubling them, often psychologically, which then manifest themselves physiologically. Right. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's really uh, critical. Uh, to your point about, yeah, I do feel that Western pharmaceutical medicine has um, uh, running into a, a sort of an asymptote of potential efficacy here. The yeah. untreated diseases such as Alzheimer's, um, uh, chronic diseases like uh, arthritis, um, type 2 diabetes are, are being treated to some extent, but far from adequately. And uh, I, I feel that we have um, pretty much exhausted a lot of the molecular basis for, for other things. Here's one mm -hmm. thought I might have to add to this conversation. Yeah. And that is, as, as you well know, when someone walks in the door, it's not uh, the, 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 the percentage of human cells that walks through the door is pretty small. 99% <laughs> of it is bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And right. um, just now, as you're only too well aware, and I suspect our listeners are, we're beginning to appreciate that from understanding or thinking about the um, metabiome uh, in, uh, in the gut uh, and its influence throughout the body, which is really quite profound. So I think that is an important new therapeutic avenue to explore, yeah. which will have enormous implications in a lot of what we traditionally think of as being fairly refractory and difficult chronic diseases, atherosclerosis, depression, um, osteoarthritis. A lot of these things, I think, will have their etiology and their pathophysiology based upon um, bacterial imbalances brought about by the uh, Western diet or any, any diet, for that matter, that is um, not what our genome evolved eating. Um, yeah. and uh, further complicated by our lifestyles and, and the way in which we um, treat the whole nutrition uh, aspect of our life, which is really pretty bad when one thinks about it. Um, so I yeah. think, I think in, to your point, I, I think that may encompass elements of both Western and Eastern traditions. Western yeah. in terms of understanding what, what bacteria are, are abnormal in a particular individual and why is that and how could we treat that? And then Eastern in the sense of how is that affecting the person's psyche, their overall energy, their overall day-to-day -day feelings. Um, and so maybe that's a, a way of giving a little more, what could I say, scientific grounding for the mm. skeptics and, right. and an avenue to explore. Yeah, yeah. Another dimension here is, of course, uh, the connection between behavioral health and physical health, uh, which, again, in our system, uh, we have differentiated, um, you know, in a very hard way, right? So behavioral health, both from a payer perspective as well as from a provider perspective, uh, is treated distinctly different from physical health. And, you know, if you go back to the, the microbiome uh, idea, um, I, I remember reading something about um, there are some nerve endings in the gut that uh, apparently the microbiome could manipulate uh, to even change your mental state. Oh, yes. That's pretty well uh, established. Yeah. The, it okay. affects the vagal nerve, which is the, the, the major nerve which innervates the gut. Um, and um, there is there are data to suggest that it could cause depression, could change one's dietary proclivity, which is an interesting thought. Um, mm. uh, and indeed, there may be 
and this is getting a bit far reaching now, but you could think almost of the back of the metabiome controlling the human to try yeah. and uh, <laughs> achieve certain goals. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, you could think of the human as sort of an enclosure, yeah, a necessary enclosure for the yeah, metabiome. Exactly. exactly, it's the robot. <laughs> well, right, right, I've right. Actually, got a little too far on this, but who knows? You know, it's, uh... <laughs> I mean, it's sort of too surprising in the sense that you know uh, the bacteria uh, has been here for four billion years, yes, and we showed up just three hundred thousand years ago. So, yeah, uh, and and you know, more from, if you look at all the metrics, um, the, you know, the bacteria is much more successful organism from, from, from any measure. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, there's right, this, so, uh, yeah. the thing that just crossed my mind as you were talking, there's a, a great example of a bacterium which will um, uh, uh, colonize ants. And yep. then it, the bacteria enter the ant's brain and change the ant's behavior such that it will climb trees and go out onto branches the distal hmm. end of branches, where the ant then dies, falls off the branch, and the bacteria therefore um, extends its um, territory. Wow. I mean, it, it's really remarkable stuff, right? But of course, as you say, that just happens because of four, well, how, I don't know how long ants have been around, maybe two billion, but two billion years of, um, of, uh, of uh, you know, trial and error and selection pressures that confer that that behavior but <laughs> yeah so that is that is um you know really difficult to understand so you know when we think about intelligence um you know we think about planning strategy uh leading to an action a single cell organism or a collection of single cell organisms uh being able to plan and execute a very complex strategy in that case right is is uh, sort of inexplicable from our definitions of you know how a complex uh, organism like the human being actually gains intelligence. Yeah, it, well, it, it, I think one has to be careful not to anthropomorphize this and careful of yeah. the words one uses. It's not intelligence. I mean, the back. So you go back two billion years, a bacterium happens to get into uh, an ant's brain. And yeah. this causes this behavior in the act, okay? It, 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 you know, some neurons are destroyed and for whatever reason, it decides to climb trees. And, and th that then confers a selective advantage on that bacterium because it gets to new territory, new sources of food. It can colonize more things and grow. And it, it's that, that that causes its success. It's not like the bacteria decides one day, well, how can I get farther away? There's <laughs> right. no food yeah. here, you know? And I think that's right. an important thing to think about. And it's the sort of hive mentality. I mean, if you look at the complexities of a termite mound or a, a beehive, there are many, or even indeed our own cities where you get emergent phenomena arising that aren't planned per se. Yeah. Uh, even with our great humans, great sort of planning and, and so-called logical in some sense uh, uh, reasoning, a lot of our, our collective behaviors emanate from no rational causes. You know, they, there's mm -hmm. something else that happens there. And, uh, and I think yeah. you, know, you know much more about the, this than me, Gil, and maybe you could opine on that. But perhaps when we have parallel quantum computing, then these things will evolve and perhaps artificial intelligence will be sort of uh, uh, evolve it will it will self-select and hopefully at such a fast rate that it can do it in real time as opposed to billions of years just by virtue of having so much capacity is that yeah is that fair um yeah so so in in uh, in computing now you know there's kind of three different directions one is the conventional chip uh, that, you know, that the Moore's law that we expected the speed to double every 18 months or so, that is plateauing, that's going to fail in a few years. Yeah. Um, you know, when we get the channels down to four nanometers or so, and then you get quantum tunneling and variety of other, you know, kind of fundamental physics related constraints right. that you can go any further. Uh, then you have quantum computing, which is a challenge in itself in qubits, um, you know, getting them to to stay and do do work. 
but more interestingly to me, and, and and this is something that I I know that you have thought about too, which is uh, there's a deficiency in computing today, and that is we have to keep data and processing separate. And that takes a lot of energy that like, takes a lot of, um, it creates a lot of complications uh, from a computing perspective. Whereas if you look at the brain, uh, and I look for your, your thoughts on this, uh, we have essentially computing or processing happening co-located with memory, right? So the, the neurons and the synapses are essentially co-located and and so you don't have a data transport energy problem. Um, and so the brain is so efficient, you know, in terms of energy use, being able to do uh, so many things. So that's the direction it looks like, you know, computing could go uh, to make computers more interesting. Uh, but what is missing there, uh, you know, is really a theory of consciousness, right? Yes, so, right. <laughs> and so without... Uh, without a you know handle on how does consciousness emerge, right. um, we won't be able to go much further than getting you know we can get a very efficient uh, machine that uses much less energy and and does all of these things that the brain uh, apparently is doing, but it's not going to be intelligent the way that we think of it uh, because we just don't know how consciousness emerges. Yeah, well, I think it's been a source of human endeavor since the very dawn of civilization to try and understand consciousness. And I doubt whether we're going to uh, offer any great insights now. However, I wonder if there's really a distinction between uh, consciousness and intelligence. Yeah. And I think one must be clear on that. Consciousness being a self-awareness, um, a sensory perception that there is something inside me um, having this conversation, having these thoughts. There is something that is me uh, and all my associated history. And as to whether a machine can ever achieve that, um, I don't know. It, it feels to me like it's probably an emergent property and one that is not readily um, understandable from a perspective of disaggregating that we will ever really be able to say what consciousness is. It's the result of this neuronal activity and this neuronal activity and you integrate those together and you have have self-awareness. And I come back to my earlier um, analogy of emergent behavior in cities, for example. Yeah. Um, why does this particular area develop into a Chinatown or that particular area into a financial center? Well, you can go back and say, well, a bank moved there or some wealthy Chinese fellow opened a couple of restaurants and it grew from there, possibly. Mm. But there are probably other things that we just can't know, but they, they emanate up from a collection of mil- thousands, if not millions of different human behaviors. Right. emerge right so maybe that's how consciousness comes and maybe that could emerge in machines given enough um parallel processing capacity and memory um right but intelligence i mean then it's a utility question really um uh, perhaps it's a misuse of the word intelligence but um i i i talk to siri all the time and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know she helps me out enormously now it's pretty much all fact-based. Well, I think it is. <laughs> um, right. But um, I think a lot of people three decades ago would say that's a pretty intelligent machine you have there. Um, you know, so it's, what is your definition of machine intelligence? I think that's an important thing to, yeah. um, to really, you know, nail down if we're going to talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it's a really difficult thing because a lot of people have different, you know, everybody has a different definition, yeah. <laughs> even, for, even for artificial intelligence, um, uh, let alone intelligence. So intelligence, in my view, and I haven't thought deeply about this, uh, in my view is, uh, you know, the ability to take a, an unknown problem uh, so you have no history, 
um, you really have uh so so ironically you know when we think about machine learning for example which is a fancy term for statistical modeling uh it, it's fundamentally driven by historical data right and so in that context i always argued that machines are not learning anything at all uh we're just putting some models together uh and we have been doing that for 100 100 years or more uh there isn't really anything there that is that is leading to intelligence uh in that context intelligence for me is something that uh takes an unknown problem uh without any history and able to solve it well let me challenge that yeah, yeah. because yeah yeah one as as i think about the evolution of human in- intelligence within an individual all right so you you uh you're conceived and uh, cells start to divide um in 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 your fetal form and eventually mm-hmm. uh, a cns system um develops and so you, you ask yourself well what what is that what is that brain um experiencing well it's it's probably experiencing one of the first things it experiences is um is smell and taste it's being perfused yeah. with fetal uh, fluid which might have some dietary effects depending on what the mother's eating and that will produce chemical changes in that brain there will be um auditory uh, stimuli uh, mother's voice etc cetera, etc cetera. and those are the, the very right. earliest experiences that are laid down and then as once you're born and other senses begin to develop how you understand the those sensory data input is by comparing them this is my assertion to your earliest memories taste sound whatever it may be so even yes. though you have no experience of looking at a face somehow you will relate that to whatever experiences you have in your brain so what you know i when you say a human can solve a problem without any prior experience it's not true all right because the the when i'm presented with a problem i have all these years of of experience of solving inferring collecting data making irrational thoughts etc why can't the machine yeah, do that because it's, something... it's that it has all yes. the data right yeah i'm saying something uh, something okay. different and so yeah i completely agree with you um, what i'm saying you know in the at the highest level is that a, a human is not necessarily intelligent unless he or she can solve a new problem so let me let me explain what i mean by that so so the 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 progression we have you know right from right from inception and all the experience that we go through uh it's truly machine learning it's the same process that we apply today um we say you know we have a million um uh, pictures of dogs a million pictures of cats if we show those pictures to a deep neural network uh over time that net network is able to say which one is a dog and which one is a cat um and i wouldn't call that intelligence and so so i i'm just debating with you uh on this so you know if you if you say that humans learn like that you know we take our experiences we take data uh we look at when things work and when things don't work so reinforcement learning in uh in ai uh jargon uh so there is you know cons- constant machine learning reinforcement learning happening in the human brain uh we can pretty much replicate that now in in a machine uh but i wouldn't call the machine intelligent in that sense and so you know um this may not may not be the right example you know so uh when einstein put the general relativity together there wasn't a lot of previous uh experiences he could use to come up with that right it, it was sort of emerging in his in his own brain uh it is not analogous to machine learning it's not empiricism it's not you yeah. know training um it's not education none of these actually education training all of that is very analogous to machine learning as we as we think about in artificial intelligence um for me intelligence the term intelligence is something very special 
which is you are able to take something that you have no idea about and 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 create something so in that sense uh, ian i i like to get your perspective on this art literature music areas like that uh people who are who are doing those types of things i would argue show intelligence whereas engineers doctors scientists um are not really showing intelligence they're showing education training perspectives experiences just like a machine would do yeah um so i i think um if one looks at art for example let's just say pictorial art uh regardless of one's cultural and aesthetic preferences and biases most people can recognize um uh, uh an an iconic artist someone who paints in a manner or a style or a subject that has never been seen before 99% yeah. of artists um are slight modifications on um other artists it's all been done before and people right. always say that about writing um you know there are there are three basic stories and they've been written about 25 <laughs> million times and it's just the particular right. juxtaposition of language or uh cultural insight or what have you but very few things are equivalent to T.S. Eliot's the wasteland or Joyce's ulysses or shakespeare's plays that mm-hmm. are truly um uh iconoclastic in that they are unprecedented which is what i think you're really talking about so i don't actually see much yeah. difference and coming back to engineers clearly yes there are engineers with engineering you're always building on what's gone before um but there are some which make a real um qualitative change which is yeah. not a uh, an uh, an increment or even a major change to something that already exists now if that's a definition of intelligence then yes i agree well i i i i'm not yeah i mean that would that's a a long way for machines to get to that point but if that's your definition of intelligence right. then 99% of what humans do is not intelligent or, yeah so way. so i take your point <laughs> yeah so so i take your the first point that it's not really the profession so if my definition holds it could hold yes. pretty much yes. in any profession um and you know the the the, the second um idea uh that you know intelligence is is really a a step function the ability to make a step function change in knowledge uh without using a lot of historical precedents because if you have historical yeah, sure. stuff uh we are showing machines are getting yeah. really and good you know us, you, you show and much much better than us yeah so so this goes into you know sort of societal design question which is uh we have all this 8.3 billion humans and a large number of us are doing things that machines are actually a lot better at doing yep. right um and so you have to ask from a you know if we if if we were to ever get to let's say level 1 society uh, i don't believe we have <laughs> we have the chance to do that but if we were you know what what will that look like i don't think humans um humans should be deployed in repetitive Uh, or any activity uh, that machines could easily sure. replicate uh and it it has to be really about how do you change things is really the question for humans yeah um well i mean one one way of thinking about this and maybe covid will accelerate this but we everyone has been talking for a long time about the 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 observation that an enormous amount of human activity as you already say can be much better done by machine and um we're seeing whole industries starting to disappear retail stores are disappearing most manufacturing is now done by automation uh etc etc so what what that does yeah. is it it has a huge impact on society and i think the most likely one that needs to to come about is a decrease in in population size but um what there also needs to be i think if we're going to have 
people not rioting in the street because they're not felt to be of value is somehow to channel all that latent energy um, and potential creativity into doing the kinds of things that you're talking about. Now, whether that will ever come to pass is, a, is, a, is, an, is an interesting question. Are some things not being realized because we're just engaged, even really quite bright people are engaged in pretty mundane activities on a day-to-day basis? So if they right. were relieved of that, paid a living wage um, and were then free to pursue whatever took their fancy, would we see right. you know, huge leaps in creativity? Yeah, I, I think some uh, Scandinavian countries are already on that path, right? So there is an economic policy question here, which is, um, you know, so universal um, minimum yeah. income, um, which is, you know, if you if you look at it from a traditional economic viewpoint, um, seems, uh, you know, not not a good policy, but universal minimum income is probably the only policy that will allow us to incrementally move away from you know the situation that we are in which is deploying humans in activities that machines could yeah. do a lot lot better and if if that hypothesis is true and we have you know sufficient amount of data already that that is you know most likely true we're going to see a huge jump in productivity and a huge jump in economic, uh, you know, the aggregate economics that we could generate uh, from from the whole system, uh, which would mean that you can actually take seven, eight billion people and say, do what you want to do, what you would like to do, and and, and really free them from, you know, the shackles of, what they're currently doing, which machines are right. infinitely yeah. better at doing, right? I, well, you know, the, <laughs> this is a very interesting question because um, there, a lot of people have argued over the centuries about how important work is to the human psyche and a need to yeah. be felt to be valued and valuable. And a lot of people engage in work which um, is not um, highly remunerative, but they feel that they are being uh, valued and useful. If we take that away and don't, and don't recognize right. it, um, what will that do to the human psyche? Is it, we're just so, is it, yeah. a, is it a learned behavior that we've acquired or is it somehow innate? If it's innate, then it has to be satisfied in some way. And I, I'm not sure that that would right, be satisfied right. I mean, one sees it with retired people and all kinds of people who or people who are made redundant um, when they are not, quote, needed by society, even though they may be financially secure, they go into depression, they sit around, they watch television. You know, they're not out there um, uh, coming up with new recipes or or new theories of or grand unification theories, you know. Um, so right. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure that yeah. that would happen. And it, but it is a very serious problem. I think it, I'm interested in the economic aspect, and maybe you can speak to this because clearly, if if I have a factory and I can I can run a machine, say 24, and not, um, I'm not going to hire people. I mean, it's just an economic um, uh, drive. So as long as we still have a capitalist-based society. I think we're going to see this happen and we're already seeing it happen in the Midwest. And that's already produced enormous political and economic consequences for the country because of disaffection amongst those voters. So we, right. we really have to address that in some way. And I'm not sure the minimum wage or what a living wage, whatever one calls it and letting people do what they want is going to solve the, the problem. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, you know, um, if you abstract the problem, I would argue that we consider work to be a good. But I would argue work is bad, is, is a bad. Um, so it is a stand in today uh, for all the things that you say, um, you know, feeling valuable, yeah. 
nourishing the human psyche because we don't have right. anything else to stand right. in right. for that uh, but it's a bad thing because humans are not really created to do work we we create machines to do yeah. work and 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 you know because we didn't have a system that allows us to do that humans are doing that right, right? so so my my view is that if we are able to do that uh, i think the transition as you say is going to be really rough um for you know our generation and perhaps the generation behind us the transition is going to be really rough in the sense that so for example you know uh, the physics books that uh, i used in in the, in the university are the same physics books that my daughter used <laughs> you know 35 yeah. years later same book you know a uh, different edition um and you know you you have to wonder so for example newtonian mechanics right um you know solving all those problems um acceleration ball you know moving down yeah. the slope and all of that are interesting things but we don't need those things anymore right we we you know machines are so much better at engineering designs they can they can you know do all the stuff that engineers do today um and so so we have to be able to redesign you know a bottom up from education so i think it was denmark no sorry um uh norway who has um sort of redesigned their education system basically saying there are no requirements anymore you know uh in 6th grade 7th grade 8th grade they're not asking students to go study physics chemistry biology but rather asking the students to design their curriculum uh sort of a personal uh personal design of education so we need to do some dramatic things bottom up for this transition to work uh but i think in the middle a lot of people are going to get caught in two different worlds i think and that's where the problem yes, is yes i i'm sure that's that's true and and uh, we're already there i mean we're clearly already there and uh yeah i yeah i i i just think it's going to have to be a natural evolutionary process what concerns me is whether we when people become so afraid and so um illiterate in science um right. that there will be such a uh, a swing towards whether it's a revolutionary or emotional based um political action that we could regress um because all this machine um productivity and learning and everything does require a relatively peaceful functioning society capable of generating power etc 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 um yeah well, right anyway i'm not sure where we're going with this other than to be fairly depressed <laughs> yeah i i yeah i mean that the complication here um also is that so today a quarter of the population i know it's in the us i don't know what the world numbers are uh nearly 25% of the population believe the sun is going around yes, the earth right and and so if we are moving into a position that says you know a lot of the prescriptive sciences uh engineering medicine all of those could be um done by machines and we are moving uh humans to you know sort of a, a different way of thinking and science maybe takes a back seat science the way that we right. define it takes a back seat uh that probably has implications more you know broader implications in terms of uh what we are trying to accomplish i guess Absolutely. right Absolutely. um I, one one thing that i think is particularly germane to this point um which i have both experienced um uh personally and also from talking to my physician friends is of course um telemedicine and um yeah. so a number of things are happening there which i think is relevant to this whole conversation you're probably aware of this but first of all a lot of um the people in in waiting rooms are there not because they really need any medical help it's more of a social psychological mm. help, right and mm. um 
so the first thing that my friends see is a decrease in the number of people that are requesting telemedicine um, consults. Secondly, the type of things that they talk about on the telemedicine consult are not the type of things they typically talk about in the office. They tend to be much better defined, what you might call a real problem, right? And then yeah. you're getting now, interestingly, as people become comfortable with, okay, the FaceTime is pretty close apart from a lot of, well, it's pretty close to actually being in the, in the doctor's office. But a telephone a telephone conference on your health is quite a way away from that and is not very far away mm. from a machine, right? And, and I right. think there are data already that most machines are better at most of the diagnostic problems that typically walk into a GP's office. So uh, I, right. I we, we, we are going to see a greater transference of trust and confidence into machines i'd rather deal with machines most of the time to be honest with you because uh, they're fairly <laughs> logical you know um yeah and they're timely and they work 724 and so there may be a, a a psychological change in the population now i think as you were suggesting if our scientific knowledge begins to erode and we no longer use that knowledge to inform our actions and our decisions what will that do? What will we become? Interesting questions. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, this goes back to, you know, kind of that evolutionary question. So if, if this were to come to come to pass as we are defining it, uh, one would imagine the selection pressures uh, would, would change the human of the future. Right. Um, you know, the, the successful humans of the future uh, could be quite different from oh, the yes, humans absolutely. today, yeah. right? So, I mean, you know, think about the pharma and the placebo problem. Yeah. You know, uh, every drug that comes to market has close to, you know, 60%, close to 40% placebo effect right. in it. And, and, and so humans are really a very inefficient um, inefficient processor, I would say, of data. Um, and that's because, you know, they get, they get, they have feelings, they have emotions, they have all this fluffy stuff um, that is not really related to data. And, and in financial markets, for example, you can demonstrably show that machines are a lot better at trading than humans sitting in front of a computer, you know, and trying yes, to trade, sure. right? Um, and so, so are we then saying that the future human, the ones who are going to survive and become successful, will have traits and characteristics quite different from what we currently see? I, I suspect that's the case, but you've, you, the key word you just said was useful. Um, how, how would, <laughs> in, on, <laughs> in what context is that? I'm more tempted to use an equally vague word, and that is happy. Um, or content. Right. Uh, perhaps content is, a, is, the, is, the, is the adjective we need to use it, it, to achieve some sort of stability. So mm. what, what mm. will a human in, whether it's 100 or maybe even only 20 years time, need to, quote, look like or behave like in order to be content in a society where 90% of what currently involves humans is taken over by machines, um, what will our relationship with those machines look like and with each other and what will we be engaged in doing and what would we, what, what qualities would we need in order to be content mm -hmm. or happy or whatever. Right. Um, I think utility is a difficult, difficult question there, a difficult word. I'm not sure what, what, that, yeah. what that means. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, it might be that, uh, and this is just a speculation, that we don't really have a very well-defined objective function, and, and it is different for different people. And so if you sit an individual down and, and ask, if there are no constraints, how do you maximize, let's call it utility, happiness, whatever you have, you know, whatever that is, what are the factors it in there? Uh, I suspect most people cannot really say what it is, right? So it's almost like 
you know, we are, we are running around trying to get somewhere, but without really defining what that destination really is. And, and, and you know, that is a complication that I think most, most of us have. Oh, for sure. And I, I think most of that, that becomes a less pressing question when most people are worried about uh, eating and sheltering and, and paying the rent and being safe. Yes. I think safety is also obviously a huge, it's sort of a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Once you've satisfied all those things around um, shelter, food, protection, safety, then you, you get into um, what we were discussing earlier. And I think that's feeling of fulfillment, of, of feeling valued. Now, whether, as we already discussed, that need to feel valued is an artifact of a work capitalist society whether it's something intrinsic in our nature i don't know um right. but you know ultimately uh Gil, one shouldn't lose sight of the demonstrable fact that it's really our genes which are controlling our destiny and our yeah. genes want nothing yeah. more than to be duplicated so so <laughs> somehow right. somewhere whether it's the the, the the drive to acquire the wherewithal and the technology to catapult our genes into the universe so that when the sun explodes we don't all disappear. I suppose ultimately that's right. That's really going to become a driver. Um, if you believe if yeah. you believe in the selfish gene, you know, I mean I think we started this whole conversation around bacteria and how they can ex- exhibit what we might think as um, intelligent behavior, but it's really driven by gene reproduction behavior. And if that's right. ultimately our goal, then our, and we, and we know for a fact, what is it? Six, three billion years, whatever the sun's going to explode into a red. I think we have five close to five years. billion. Okay, so though. We, got, we got a little time, yeah. but um, you know, um, <laughs> but ultimately I suppose that would be an interesting question to ask is the, the prototypical asteroid question. So there's an asteroid coming. It's too big to blow up with nuclear warheads. Um, it's going to hit us in, you know, 400 years or whatever. What are we going to do? And I suspect yeah. a lot of that would involve getting to Mars or getting uh, cells into systems that could be sent to Andromeda or with the hope of, you know, a speciation after that. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe that gives us, um, you know, a way to think about definitions of intelligence and consciousness, too. So perhaps intelligence is an ability to change the programmatic aspects of an organism. So if you say, you know, food, sex, that's about it, food and sex are the only factors in the objective function that is programmatic. Uh, maybe intelligence is is an organism changing that, right? Um, overriding it, you mean? O- o- overriding it, yeah, overriding it, or 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 you know, uh, fundamentally changing that Why objective would it do function. That? So, um, so if you if you you know, so there's this idea of level zero, level one, level two societies, right, where you you reach a level of consciousness that is not individual but really societal yeah. consciousness um in which case you know your objective functions are quite different you know the the 8.3 billion people that we have today the the difference in their genome structures as you know is is right. minute um and if you buy that if you believe that then you already have enough data. You know, you don't have the consciousness aspects of it, but you have enough data to potentially reprogram your own mind, right? To, to say, you know, that idea uh, is outdated. Um, but, but I don't know. I think uh, I, 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 for me, it is sort of a step function change. Either we get there or we don't, right? If you don't get there, we're going to tread along the way that we currently are and that objective function will continue to be yeah. the same. Yeah. Hmm. I <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by your whole concept of, of stepping outside and changing it. And I, as I said earlier, and I press this as a very mundane way of thinking about it, but I, I wonder where the impetus, where the drive will come from to make that change yeah. if it's not one of the fundamental drives like 
gene like well, I say gene duplication. I mean that that's really what it's about. I mean it's not even it's not even right. organism thinking about a human per se. It, it's somehow the the genes yeah. that drive us to 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 reproduce. And if yeah, I I think what is likely to happen mm-hmm. is, is, is it will be something along those lines. It will be something around that successful reproduction that will bring about change. I Yeah, but, but what if we have technologies here? And what if we have technologies that guarantees you that reproduction. So, you know, this idea that an individual is, you know, or the, or the system's objective function is, re, you know, duplication, reproduction of the genes. Suppose we, we introduce technology that guarantees with no failure yeah. that's going to happen. Then could you abstract the human yeah, from that process? Yeah. Well, yes. Well, that, that, so, that, that, that <laughs> whatever's doing the guaranteeing right, would yeah. probably be of human origin. But it could be a machine origin, Why too. Why would a machine do that? Because it would be an intelligent, that would be, a, coming back to our earlier this point, that would be an intelligent yeah. decision by the machine to say, okay, well, maybe this is it. If, if a machine does gain intelligence, as we've been discussing, um, then right. one of the ways it's going to calm the human population down and stop them from pulling the plug is to guarantee their reproductive success. So, so it comes up right. with whatever that may look like and then everyone calms down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess that is a, that's an optimistic <laughs> note. We should stop there before we get any deeper into that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, this has been, has been excellent, uh, Ian. I think we should yes, do it more uh, often. It's been great fun, uh, Gil. I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah, let's let's plan on that. Excellent. Okay, yeah, thanks so much, Ian. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.